Hi, everybody. Good evening. It's my pleasure tonight to have a discussion with Howard Tolman. And Howard is a serious collector in the world. He's located in Chicago. Howard, I think I've known you close to 30 years. I can remember the first time I met you, you were officing in a building on LaSalle and Ontario. I think that's right. And you had art hanging all over the place there. You took me to your home. You had art all over in, uh, throughout your home also. Do you still live in the same house? Uh, well, so we have, uh, we have, uh, I, I think probably not. I think probably we're in a different house. All right, let's go backwards. You, you grew up in the Chicago area? I grew up in St. Louis and I moved to Highland Park when I was about 12. Interesting. Um, where in Highland? I grew up in Highland Park. <laughs> Did we know each other in grade school? Uh, probably not. I think I'm older than you are. Although it's close, it's certainly close. Yeah, I let, my family moved away uh, before my seventh grade year, so it wasn't. I wasn't. Right. You know, we didn't overlap by much, but we were there. Interesting. How was art part of your life as a kid? Well, my mother was an artist. Yeah, so for sure that. But uh, art, really, in terms of in terms of me, probably started, you know, when I was, uh, when I first began sort of working in the early 70s. Do you remember an artist named Abbott Patterson? No. He, my mother was an artist too, and she studied with him in, in Ravinia and Highland Park and, you know, like that. I actually, actually the artist in Highland Park that I, the only one I had any real dealings with for it, well, was uh, Edith Altman. Sure. Interesting. Okay, so when you sorry, so let's go back. You, you, when you started a business, is when you got interested in art. When I was practicing law, that was uh, when I first graduated law school um, and started practicing law. That's when I started collecting. Actually, why? Uh, I had a lot of friends who were artists, and uh, they weren't making a living, and I was making a living. Not that I was enjoying it, but I figured a good thing to do would be to buy their art and sort uh you know and sort of support them and that's really where that's where really where the stuff began has a year gone by since then that you have not purchased a work of art well i don't think so i don't think so how many you probably buy art many most months of the year don't you yeah yeah we do we buy all the time we only have one rule which is i have to it's sort of the same rule as with t-shirts and pairs of shoes, which is, you know, my wife's position now is I have to donate some art to a museum in order to be able to buy some more art. So it's worked out real well for her. <laughs> Why for her? Well, because, you know, she feels like uh, we're, uh, you know, she, her position is that God forbid something happened to me and she'd have to deal with all this stuff and dispose of all this stuff. So her view is she plans to just blow it up, you know, and, <laughs> This is true of all the collections. It's not limited to the artwork. Let's get down to some numbers. How many works of art do you guess you've acquired since you came out of law school? I think we have about 1,400 pieces in the collection right now. Yeah, but you've deaccessioned and you've given away too, right? Yeah, so we've given away 45 pieces, I think, over the last uh, dozen years. Okay. So you don't feel compelled to have to... Um, you're not opposed to buying something and storing it. Well, no, we display everything, with the, with the exception of the um, the pop art and some of the really ridiculous photorealistic stuff. Everything we have is on display, and either at home, at school, or in our we have a private, you know, museum slash loft space. So we have about 900 pieces between uh, home and the loft, and then we have about another 300 at school. Okay, and the, do they rotate sort of kind of? Or do they yeah, we, well, we lend we lend to museum shows, and we are constantly sort of adding space at school. So we have we have about one hundred and twenty thousand square feet at school. So is that the is that the logic behind expanding the school? Uh, it's not the sole logic, but it has <laughs> uh, it has a certain charm. <laughs> um. I presume, I mean, you've done pretty well in business. I presume you you tend to pay in full for works of art when you acquire them. No, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't okay, say tell that. me, tell me what, tell me what the guide is. 
Well, the, the guy, well, I'll tell you, first of all, I'll just tell you about the last piece that I just bought, which you can see on the blog. It's a self-portrait of an artist. Where is it on the blog? Oh, it's probably two or three. If you just scroll down on the blog, you'll see a self-portrait of a guy with sort of a hoodie. Um, I must be looking at the wrong blog. I'm looking at Tolman.blogspot.com. Yeah. So you, you should be able to go uh, down a little bit and you'll see a painting. I don't see any images except a picture of you. Well, scroll, you have to scroll down. Uh, okay. Got it. Okay. All right. Let me, so let me anyway, so yes. he, so he had three pieces. I've been working really closely with a, a lady named Didi uh, Menendez who does Poets and Artists, which is a fabulous, you know, publication. And, uh, she, um, uh, Didi, for whatever reason, uh, you know, sources a tremendous amount of, uh, really good artists who are, you know, my particular taste, which is sort of realist and photorealist and everything else. So she had in, in the current issue, which I don't think is out yet, but in the current issue, she had three paintings by this guy. And I sent him a note and I said I was really interested in his paintings. And, uh, he sent me back a note and he said, you know, basically these are really, near and dear to his heart, this one in particular, and then there was one of his dad and, and one other one. And so he said he really didn't want to sell them, but he would sell them for a, a price, and it was, you know, I think it was $10,000 a piece or something. But he said that that was really intended to indicate that he didn't want to sell them. <laughs> so so I, I said, you know, I wrote him back, and I said, you know, this is really sort of a bad formulation that he ought to, if he doesn't want to sell them, he should say he doesn't want to sell them. If he wants to sell them, he should pick a reasonable price. And, uh, you know, that I'd be happy to, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to respond to that. So ultimately, that's what happened. Ultimately, he said, okay, well, here's what I think is a fair price. And we agreed on that. And I bought the piece that you see on the website. But just to give you a little background on this whole process, I've had a lot of cases. So I, I probably get... 50 submissions a, a month of uh, art from different artists all over the world now. And um, I put them, I sort them very quickly, and then I think about the various pieces. And sometimes what happens is a very interesting process, which I think I've pretty much cured most of the artists that I deal with of doing. But what happens is if a certain amount of time goes by, and I always respond promptly and say, I'm interested and I'll get back to you. But I don't always get back to them in the short instances because there's a few other things going on. But anyway, I do I do eventually get back to them. But in the meantime, some of them send me a note and sort of negotiate against themselves by saying, you know, I'd be happy to give you a big discount. Uh, you know, I'm sure we can agree on a price, all of this kind of stuff. And I've taken recently to sort of responding to the artist by saying, look, here's how I'd like to proceed. If if I really want to buy a piece and like a piece, then I'll tell you that I like the piece, and then we could talk about the price. But the price of the piece is not going to, you know, drive my decision as to whether or not it's a piece that I would like to own. So I don't think it's in your interest to sort of, you know, sell your stuff cheap or get into a negotiation, uh, you know, because it's a waste of time if I'm not interested. And if I'm interested, then we can have that conversation. And that's turned out to be uh, a pretty good formulation and one that spends, you know, as little time as possible talking about money and as much time as possible talking about the art. So that's been the process. But as a general rule, you know, my position is if I'm dealing with a gallery, I would expect a significant discount from the gallery side of the calculation. And if I'm dealing directly with an artist, uh, generally, you know, I don't, I mean, we, we generally just agree on a price that the artist is comfortable with. And it's not typically a, a formula or a specific uh, number. Um, that brings up, I think, a really interesting point. So you, I mean, an awful lot of collectors don't deal with artists directly. You do most of the time? No, I don't deal with artists who are represented by galleries. By and large, uh, what I do, however, is if I come across work in a publication or something and I do the research and they're either not represented um, or it's not a gallery that I deal with, uh, then I'll, you know, I'm perfectly happy to deal with them directly. I mean, if they're represented by a gallery, 
you know, there are at least two really good reasons to have the gallery in the process. One is Agreed. it's re it's really hard to say to an artist, you know, I don't like your work. I mean, it's just a very tough conversation. And two, the price conversation is also really hard. I mean, a lot of the work that I have is, uh, you know, hyper realistic. I mean, there, I have drawings that literally have taken a year or two years to do. And, you know, to tell somebody that you don't think that that's whatever number they've picked or whatever price they've assigned, I mean, to tell them that you just don't think their labor and their effort and their art is worth it is very hard. So whenever possible, I'm perfectly happy to support, you know, support the gallery system and work through the dealers. So, all right, but I mean, but all right. So, how how does this break down? How many? How much are you buying from an artist? How much are you buying from you know a dealer? Well, I say the, I say most of the international work I try to deal with directly with the artists because I don't have a pre-existing relationship with with most. I have a few galleries in Italy, a few galleries in London, a couple in Spain, and a couple in Mexico that I deal with. But by and large, um, I don't have you know I haven't dealt through. Uh, a lot of galleries internationally. In the U.S., I would say very rarely would I buy a piece from an artist who wasn't, who I knew to have a gallery because I, you know, I probably deal with the top 100 galleries in the United States as it is in my space, only in my space, not, not with respect to every kind of art. But certainly there aren't any contemporary realist galleries in the country that I don't deal with. Are you mostly acquiring paintings and drawings? Yeah, and, and sculptures more, uh, just more recently because we we have display space, but we don't have as much in the way of wall space in some of the spaces. But also because I've been working, you know, I'm a, on the board of the New York Academy of Art, so I'm seeing a lot more sculpture there from our students than I used to. That's kind of cool. Um, but what medium? All right. So when you're seeing work by your, talk about what your business is and what your students do and where they're going. Well, our students, our students in Chicago are all in the digital media space. So we have about 600 students, and they all make digital media, whether it's film or animation or games or. What's the name media. of this business? It's called Tribeca Flashpoint Media Arts Academy, okay. and it's right downtown, right next to City Hall, and then. So that's the digital part of our business. And then in New York, we have the New York Film Academy, New York Academy of Art. We have about 120 MFAs there, the two-year uh, fine arts master's program. And they're all practitioners. So all they do is paint, draw, or sculpt. So we, I have about 100 studios there. And it's very much like a kid in a candy store. So every time I go, uh, I'm able to walk through and see what, you know, 100 different really good artists. Um, are doing. Can I, where can I go to show more images while we keep talking? Can I just keep scrolling? Uh, well, you can scroll down. You'll have to go quite a ways for more art. I, I would say you can, you, you can go to Tulman.com. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, go up, go up. Oh, yeah. All right. So just, if you click on art here. So if you click on view collection, you know what? Yeah, view view collection is fine. Then any any letter has, you know, you can do as much or as little clicking as you want. So every every letter there is uh, has uh, a painting behind it. Okay. Um, so, so the other thing is, Paul. Though, if you go back, go back to art for a minute and uh, look at, click on uh, view loft. Okay. And that that shows you uh, a bunch of different views of the loft, uh, and you can see a lot of the paintings there. That's probably more efficient. I know a lot of these people. Um, well, you probably know that piece of Joe Siegenthaler there. Yeah. Uh, but here's I'm, I'm curious about this. I mean, so you're dealing with people who are working in new media a lot. Do you acquire? Yeah. Do you acquire new media? No. no. Explain. No, we have a couple. Of, we have a couple of video pieces, but that would be very rare. We have. Uh, I think I can only think of about two pieces. Um, that is were this an arbitrary? Is this an arbitrary restraint? Uh, yeah, it is. It's totally a restraint that that says uh, 
you know, just like I wouldn't buy a landscape. Uh, I mean, you know, in order to even remotely stay on top of what's going on, you know, we just arbitrarily said no abstract work, no landscapes, all about the figure, all about realist uh, work, and all living artists, you know, to the largest extent possible. And so, that's, so, that, that alone is a gigantic undertaking, so. Yeah, it is indeed. So the trap lawyer wouldn't qualify it. Well, we have some, but it generally wouldn't qualify. That's correct. There's a few guys who are doing hyper-realistic Trump Loy, and so that they, you know, they would qualify. What kinds of things do you see when you, you know, because you, you speak with a fair number of artists, and you, 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 you know, I mean, I'm teaching this course, and I feel like to a large extent the people who come out of Flashpoint Academy don't need this course as much as people who come out of the Art Institute and other art schools or people who haven't gone, you know, who haven't gotten an MBA. I think this course teaches people how to address the art world and gives them strategy and how to how to navigate. I think Flashpoint does that to a large extent. Um, well, it doesn't, to, it doesn't to some extent. I mean, certainly we we've concluded that the business, you know, that being able to, you know, be uh, a complete professional is really essential, and whether that's being able to read and write and communicate or do some math or understand the business aspects of the industries that we're in. We think all of those are in fact uh, pretty pretty pivotal to being successful. And uh, so, you know, we do spend some time on that. We, you know, our, our estimate is that about 20 or 25 percent of our curriculum has to do with people's skills and managing your life as opposed to managing technology or production or things like that. And that's exactly consistent with employers who come in and say all the time, uh, you know, that talent is okay, but, you know, talent uh, and technology are probably number five or six. It's things like, is, there, is the person a good collaborator? Are they a good, uh, you know, uh, team player? Are they responsible and accountable? All of that. So this, what you're looking at now is a, is a 3D virtual tour um, and if you look at the box that says location one, there's about 12 or 13 different views of the loft, uh, which are zoomable and selectable. You can actually stop the view at any time and zoom in on uh, elements within the view. Yeah, you really are good at embracing new technology. Yeah. Well, this is this turned out to be this is technology that we put in place before they started using this to show homes. But it's very powerful. And you can yeah, actually you can actually scroll up or down, you can look at the ceiling, you can see, you know, and then if you click, yeah, so you can zoom in. How do I continue? Well, go to location. No, how do I keep scrolling? How do I let it just go back to auto? Go back to auto? Probably if you see where it says plus on the left hand side. All right, so go minus and it'll take you back. Now you should be able to just now just just put your cursor in the picture and, and move it to the left or right. Doesn't there you go. All right, I'm gonna go to new location. Um So you talk with a, speak with a lot of artists. I mean, what are the, and, you're, and tonight we're speaking to a group of artists. What are the things that you see artists doing that you think they shouldn't do? What is the kind of advice do you give them? You know, I mean, I, I imagine you see repeating errors. Well, I, you know, recurring errors. Look, I, I, you know, I think that uh, you know you have to be a business person. Uh, you know, if you want to be you know, able to continue doing your art. So, I mean, I do think there are, you know, business elements in the in the process. But honestly, uh, you know, I think I think almost every artist has a different set of needs and you know a different set of reasons for why they're doing what they're doing. So, I you know I would be reluctant to uh, say that there's a single set of anything that uh, that works. I I do think though that. Uh, you know, you have to, uh, and, and we say this all the time, I mean, it's great to be making art, but I do think that you need to try to figure out if there's an audience, uh, you know, 
for that. And if not, you either have to think about doing something different or you have to decide that, you know, it's not something that you're going to make a living at. It's something that you're going to do because you enjoy it. And then you'll have to figure out how to make a living elsewhere. Do you buy, do you buy more than one work of art from many artists? You know, I do, not not to a huge extent, but there's some artists whose work I just really love, and uh, every time they do a new group of uh, paintings, uh, I tend to, you know, say, all right, well, I, I should get one from this series or something. But I would say that's less than five or six artists. So how does this work? You're looking at work, you're doing research, and then you're showing it to Judy and you're asking her for her concurrence? No, Judy, there's two two different other decision makers. The dean of the school gets to say that something is too naked or too uh, in your face. So she gets a little say over the school contents. And then Judy gets a complete say over the contents of home. Uh, and then the loft is where everything goes that only I'm interested in. So you're looking at the loft. Right. And... What else goes on in the loft besides art? Is this for parties? It's for, we do uh, charitable events. We do dinners there. We do, uh, it's, you know, I do some writing there and some other things. Um, do you use this, uh, do you use the loft for estate planning purposes? No, no. It's just to store a lot of the uh, work, but they have it in a, in a place where we can also share it with people. I mean, I wouldn't you realize, you, you realize you could though, right? I mean, if you, you could get, you could create your own foundation, which you may have already done. Yeah, no, we have a, yeah, we have a foundation. And the foundation could be at the loft. Right. And then, and then it's out of your residence and it's, you know, it, it isn't part of your estate. Yeah, no, we have okay. a foundation. Um, I'd like to open this up to some questions from the folks who are, you know, participating or who, who are not yet participating in this discussion. Um, all right, this is great. Who has questions out there, you guys? You know, I think I need to stop sharing, maybe. Can you guys all see? I'm going to unmute somebody arbitrarily. Lynn, can you see the list of the participants so that you can raise or lower your hand? Um, let's see. Yeah, I can. So then, Okay, well, let me go backwards. I'm going to stop sharing so people can raise their hand for sure, and then maybe I'll redo it again in a moment. Um, who's got a, who wants to say something? Cool. All right, Mark, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell, well, first of all, thanks for uh, uh, speaking with us and supporting the arts to the degree that you do. And I was curious uh, what are the top three to five art publications that you uh, consider valuable uh, in terms of uh, looking for artists? Uh, I would say the first one is Poets and Artists. Okay. Uh, the second one, which is a uh, you know unbelievably uh, valuable, I would say the American Art Collector. I would say New American Paintings. Um, and those are the those are the top three that uh, and then juxtapose, uh, which is juxtapose is sort of a uh, a detour for us because it it has to do with uh, sort of some this intersection between anime and what's going on in Japan and what's going on with car art and comic art and all of that. So juxtapose is a source for things like Robert Williams and all of the, you know, Todd Shore, all of those people who would be outside of our normal, you know, uh, strictly realist, strictly, you know, uh, contemporary stuff. But uh, juxtapose is something that I uh, see regularly as well. And then we probably get uh, 500 catalogs uh, a month, 500 different sort of announcements, catalogs, whatever, and then the other major source is really the, uh, the contemporary auctions. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, Top Chalda, you had a comment. Go ahead. And while you're doing that, I'm going to share. I'm trying to unmute you. Are you doing it at the same time? Hold on. I'm not succeeding. 
Chandra, can you unmute yourself? Work on that. I'll come back to you. I'm sorry. I don't know. Am, am I unmuted? Yeah, you are. Go ahead. Okay. I, I was having a little technical difficulty. You're all frozen up on me off and on sorry. this evening. Um, my question is, um, how important is it to you uh, the day that a, an image was created when you're looking to purchase or just enjoy it? Uh, uh, is it... Um, a newer work is more interesting to you, or is it just a great image, even if the artist did it 10 years ago? Does, does the date factor into your enjoyment or your decision to purchase? No, it really doesn't. It really doesn't. Okay, I would say you. that I, I would say that um, on that score, um, there are artists who, over time, have changed their the way they work and the kind of paintings that they do. And so sometimes uh, I'll buy, I'll have, or I'll own older works, and then we'll buy something new uh, because they've changed their style or they're working in a different medium or something like that. But by and large, the date doesn't matter at all. How about, Thank you. How about, what's the age, thanks, John. What's the age breakdown of the artists whose work you're acquiring? Are, you, are they all under 30, or does it not particularly matter? I would say that they're all um, 40 to 60. It doesn't matter how long they've engaged in their career? I think that, you know, I, I think we feel really strongly that they have to have a substantial ex uh, amount of experience and craft before they can do whatever the art they want to do is. I mean, you know, this is sort of an ongoing discussion a feeling like first you have to be a really terrific draftsman and then you can do it in crayon and say that's my choice but if somebody just does it in crayon and they're crappy that's certainly not something that we would be so i i would think that uh i would think most of the artists that we deal with have been doing this i'd say on average 10 to 20 years okay cool Therese, your turn. And other people, if you have questions, go ahead and raise your hand. Therese, take it away. No, we're not hearing you yet. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Um, good evening, Howard. Thank you so much for sharing your collection. I'm thrilled to see such a huge collection of figurative art being a figurative artist. It's kind of a rare treat, and I'm very familiar with many of the artists that you have in your collection. Um, I have a question about the way you choose the work. I know you talked a little bit about this, but when you're getting pieces from artists, do you go onto their website? Um, do you look at their older work? Is their exhibition history really important to you, or does the work stand alone? Well, I would, I would say I certainly go on their website, and I certainly find, and you know, sometimes there'll be a show of current work and I'll be interested in the artist, but I won't necessarily love any of the uh, given pieces. So I'll go on their website and look at older work, and then I'll ask whether the pieces that I'm specifically interested in um, are available. Uh, having said that, I can tell you that I, the, I spend almost no time on exhibition history. I don't, that really doesn't uh, impact the choice at all. Hmm. Okay, good, thank you. How much of this do you think? I don't, this is, I don't know how to ask this delicately. I mean, do you do you try to um, get your art out into the world? Do you try and generate exhibition exposure for your artists, or is it mostly passive, and curators are coming to you? Well, the website was intended to let people, galleries, and museums, and things have an efficient way to go through the art and select art and then request it for shows. So we get requests all the time for shows. We've done a couple of museum shows where they made a you know major catalog and things like that. We we do articles. I think we've had three or four articles just in the American Art Collector and in uh, Poets and, and Artists. By the way, I, the reason I say American Art Collector is it's very, very hard for a publication to do as good a job of commercially helping and supporting artists as those people do and still be a credible publication. But 
they do the best of anybody I I've seen uh, really ever. And uh, I think I think that that's that's one of the great things they do is uh, they do a very good job of uh, supporting you know the galleries they deal with, supporting the artists who advertise there or whose work they're interested in. So uh, you know I think they're I think they were a real important addition particularly in the last couple of years because one whole part of that magazine has to do with how much art they're selling for people and you know at a time when people were nervous about should they be buying art you know is the world going to end all those things every single month having them saying we're selling stuff right off the cover we're selling stuff right out of our book you know there's tremendous continuing interest in art i think that was really helpful i mean in a, in a tough economic time i think it was great that they were as active as they were. When you work with art, how much, what percentage of the art you're getting is from outside the U.S.? I'd say about 10% uh, now, 10 to 15%. And Mexico and Italy and Germany. And frequently those situations are where you are dealing directly with the artist. Yes. How does it, who works out the shipping? Uh, it depends. The um, you know by and large that's not a uh, that hasn't been a big issue. Uh, the artists usually coordinate it with one of my assistants, and uh, it depends. Like uh, so if it's a big mounted framed piece, it's a much bigger production. We just bought a nice drawing from somebody in Canada, and she's just going to put it in a tube and ship it, and it will will uh, mount it here. It totally depends. Does the fact that somebody might be out of the country and shipping be more challenging serve as a constraint to um, what you buy? No, it's uh, you know the we we just recently had an interesting issue about use tax here, where the state said you know we've seen a couple of pieces be shipped in and uh, we think you owe us some use tax or something like that. But by and large now, the you know each of the countries is getting more sophisticated. Mexico has its own problems, but uh, uh, Italy and London, uh, Germany, they you know it's a it's a you can use DHL, you can use FedEx. They they handle the whole thing. It's just a flat transaction, and they'll do the customs and they'll do the duties and all of that kind of stuff. Mexico is tougher because uh, you know Mexico has all these. Sort of money laundering issues and and uh, other issues, so they're much harder. And you you tend to be told by an artist who might live in a small town in Mexico, you know, it's almost like send it to the general store down the street, and that makes you know that's a source of you know considerable nervousness. So sometimes actually, sometimes a, a Mexican artist will ship the piece to a Texas gallery, and then we'll deal with the Texas gallery. Do you usually pay for the art before the art gets shipped? Yeah, we always do. Trusting, and that hasn't that hasn't backfired. No. Beautiful. Karen, go ahead. Hi, Howard. Um, Hi. I, I was reading um, a little bit on your website, and it said that you're involved with the mayor's new cultural group, and also yeah. with. Um, Governor Quinn's Innovation Group. Could you talk a little bit about those and also um, how you think Chicago's cultural plan will affect artists here? Well, the uh, you know the cultural. So I'm on I'm on the cultural advisory council, which is um, advises uh, DCAS and uh, in terms of the arts and things. And so the cultural plan was just. Uh, formally announced we did it uh, at the Perez uh, Elementary School and we had Yo-Yo Ma and uh, Renee Fleming there it was very nice they work with the kids it was an amazing uh, experience for the kids I think uh, and that the plan has hundreds of projects all across a pretty interesting spectrum of uh, very expensive and long-term projects and then a whole bunch of community projects that I think we're working now with Indiegogo and with Kickstarter to try and see if we can break out 30 or 40 of those smaller projects to fund them uh, through the neighborhoods using some of these crowdfunding uh, systems. 
And then part two of that is that uh, you know the uh, you know the mayor has increased the budget of uh, the cultural arts department about nine percent. He's definitely supportive of the arts. And the most important thing about the new cultural plan is that instead of having CPS have its own stuff, this really pushes the two together. So the art programs for CPS will be consistent with the community art programs that uh, the city is doing elsewhere instead of being redundant or duplicative or you know equally unfunded or what have you. So I think that we're going to see more art teachers in the schools. We're going to see art as a core subject, uh, which will be a big uh, step forward, and I think that uh, I'm, I'm quite encouraged about a lot of what's going on. Now, the other thing that's going on that is interesting is I'm not sure what's going to happen to the Humanities uh, Festival, and the reason is that it turns out that the private sector people, whether it's Chicago Ideas Week or TEDx or TEDx Midwest, um, these folks are putting their money where their mouth is. They're bringing, you know, and doing these events. And honestly, they sort of are dwarfing, uh, you know, what the city is capable of doing given the city's scarce resources. So that's going to change some things too. It's going to it's going to be hard to know how many different festivals and events and things we're going to have. I I suspect we're going to see a f fewer, some more privately funded, and they'll be much larger than uh, than you know one for every neighborhood and things like that. So I think, uh, on the whole, I'm pretty enthusiastic about what's going on in the theater space and in the art space as well. I don't know, you know, if we're going to have yet another arts area, whether the, the galleries are going to stay on Superior Street and Wells Street or whether they're going to migrate again. I think what, what happened that was sort of a surprise was the whole migration to Peoria Street and that whole area. I think the the economy got ahead of them much more quickly than it you know maybe it has in the past, and so there's a lot of galleries there. That I think they're trying to figure out where do they go next, and I, I'm not sure there's a good answer for that. I don't I don't know that we know where the next gallery district is going to be if there is such a thing. Okay. Can Thank I you, ask, Can I ask a personal question? Sure. Um. Your background is is varied, and you're in music, you're in technology and law, and I was wondering, was it difficult for you to segue from one field to the other, and are you using your now are you are you consolidating that at all with with um, art and your answer? Well, we well look. Uh, the last ten years, all I've really paid attention to is building schools, so. Uh, so in each of the schools, art has been a major, major part of the environment that we've created. And uh, whether it was at Kendall or whether it was Experiential, where we were dealing with fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, where we built a, a whole city, um, or Flashpoint, I mean, the intention is that uh, the art and surrounding the students with examples of excellence and craft and professionalism is a huge part of the, you know, the whole culture that we're trying to build. And so to me, it's all integrated. It's all of a piece, you know, whether it's uh, doing a school or, you know, doing, uh, you know, we have a lot of different businesses, obviously. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have questions? You guys all showed up early tonight and then you don't have as many questions. There you go. Thank you, Lynn. Um, hi, thank you for speaking with us. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned three countries where you can provide international art, Italy, Mexico, and Germany. Um, I was wondering what you're seeing happening in those countries that interest you, and then if there are any particular parts of the U.S. where you think you tend to gravitate to in terms of personal work. Yeah, I am. Uh... In terms of the United States, uh, we spend a great deal of time in uh, New York, San Francisco, uh, and I would say to a certain extent, uh, you know, we're seeing some in, in the Texas, you know, area, uh, and maybe a little in Santa Fe, but not a, not a whole lot, although I'm looking at a school in Santa Fe right now. But uh, 
in terms of international, I mean, Germany is just exploding. Denver, by the way, is exploding. Denver has a really interesting uh, sort of contemporary art thing going on right now because they have such a smart governor who was the mayor of uh, the city of Denver, and Denver is just financially exploding in so many interesting ways that it's really uh, helping to support the arts there as well. Uh, but Germany is just alive. It's just a very, very exciting time. There's a huge, you know, group of young artists. It's very much akin to Williamsburg or Brooklyn, what's going on there and what's been going on there for a while. Italy just has a tremendous number of serious contemporary, you know, realist painters. And uh, we've just sort of fallen into a couple of different groups. And, you know, they introduce us to their friends and their friends turn out to be terrific painters too. So, I mean, that's been fortuitous. And then Mexico, you know, Mexico sort of arose in a, in a couple of different ways. But one of the interesting things is there's a new cafe. I don't even know the name of it. I'm sorry to say right next to the state, uh, to the Chicago Theater. It's on uh, Ben Place, which is off of State Street. And this is the guy who's sort of the Starbucks of Mexico. It's called Black Coffee. And, and when he builds one of his coffee outlets, he builds a cafe. And I know he flew up about a dozen artists from uh, Mexico and they did murals in this place. It's a gorgeous place. And the furniture is art and the cups are art, ceramic art and stuff. So a wonderful place. And so he's talking about opening a few of those. Some of the artists that he brought up uh, were artists who, you know, they came to see the school and they came to see us and they showed us some of their work. And so, again, we just sort of fortuitously were exposed to a bunch of artists um, who are uh, Mexico, you know, working in Mexico in a variety of different ways. So, so that's, that's pretty much it. But I would say that the most exciting, um, you know, sort of hotbed of a new kind of uh, figurative art is a bunch of the different people um, in Germany, you know, who are working really terrific. Thank you. Lynn, do you have more to say? No, thank you. That was, that was great to know. Okay, cool. Mika, your turn. Uh, hi, Howard. Um, was there ever, like, a real crazy, unexpected place where you found art that just blew your mind? Well, I, you know, I actually, uh, you know, I actually was, uh, you know, present for some of the, uh, you know, the craziness of the uh, the early Phyllis Kind eras and, uh, you know, Darger and some of these other things. I mean, I was actually in some of those environments over the years. So I would say that uh, certainly some of the Chicago uh, stuff was the was as surprising as, as anything else but other than that i mean i can't really think of i mean we have a few you know artists who are functionally insane in the collection but um i would say that uh most mostly i can't think of any really peculiar or different place other than henry darger certainly were you interested in henry darger in in, in, in the beginning i mean before uh, no you couldn't have been yeah. I mean, you knew yeah, him before he you knew his work before he died? Yeah, yeah. So we had I mean the big thing about, you know, his stuff was uh it was almost you can explain it because most people probably don't know about his life and what he did. Well, it was, I, I mean, you know, he was a you know, he was a relative recluse who painted uh on multiple sides of pieces of paper that this whole multi multi year saga of these young girls and um uh, in a whole sort of war culture and, you know, all kinds of sort of uh, multi-sexual crazy uh, sort of things. But they were, uh, you know, they were sort of beautifully done in some ways. One of the big problems was displaying them because they were on these long sheets and painted on both sides. And so, you know, Carl uh, Hammer was one of the early uh, sort of people who tried to figure out how to display it. it and it wasn't easy. So, I mean, it was, uh, uh, you know, so here's a, you know, this is a, that was a, a nice image of. Uh, yeah, I don't know why it just disappeared. I'll find, I'll get some more. But anyway, it was, um, so, you know, his whole, he, he built this whole imaginary world with these little girls. Here's black coffee. So, yeah, you know, one of the other, yeah, one of the other things that he does, uh, the black coffee guy, is he makes a book about each of these environments that they build. 
and it's quite it's quite amazing. But yeah, so here's the uh, here's the little girls and sort of the whole darker uh, you know world. And these are you know these pieces you know have become ridiculously costly now. So I mean it's a different uh, it's a whole other set of issues associated with conservation and display and everything else. When things get expensive, do you continue to hold on to them, or I yeah, mean, yeah, we do. We we, you know, I mean the so I mentioned before the the pop collection that we hold on to, but we can't really display. I mean the insurance issues were really ridiculous. So those are stored, and those will go as a as a group to a museum, much like the we gave almost all of our images work to the Smart and to the Museum of Contemporary Art. I suspect that the um, the pop collection will go to a New York museum. Um, but when you say pop, are you talking American pop or should, what, yeah. what? Yeah, American pop. All the uh, all the pop artists. So where's that art? Is that art hanging in your home or is it that? No, what? it's all in, it's all in a vault in New York at uh, Sotheby's. With the intent of being sold in the near? No, it's not going to be sold. You want to donate it. Yeah, it's just secure. It's just secure there. They have a they have a really good uh, program for you know long term sort of stuff, and then it it makes it very easy to have it available if the museums want to inspect anything that's going to be donated and things like that. So, why are you waiting? Uh, no particular reason. I mean, we you know we're just trying to decide uh, you know. What should go where and and when? I mean, I don't think there's a huge amount of interest right now in that space. So I mean, we've just you know just been uh, sitting on it. If there was a major you know pop sort of set of shows coming up or something like that, we might you know bring it out then at that point. Okay, cool. Therese, go ahead. Okay, hi. Um, do you ever go uh, visit any of the artist studios and also your loft? I know you said that you use it for charitable events and such. Um, do you ever allow any of your students from your college to go through and see the artwork, or do you ever, ever allow anybody to tour your artwork that you have in your collection? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, the school, you know, we have tours all the time. So the school has about 300 paintings. The loft uh, art teachers bring classes through. Uh, and then for all of the, for Art Expo or Expo Chicago, uh, we, um, we always make it available for sort of VIP tours. So I think this year we had four tours there in connection with Expo. Uh, and then we do, uh, for the Goodman, for Steppenwolf, for Victory Gardens, uh, I can't remember, there's probably two others that we do, uh, we'll do a dinner at the loft. With one of my chefs, and then you know, well, somebody will come and talk about the art, and they have a chance to walk around the the loft as well. So, very cool. And then my second question: Do you ever go visit artist studios in yeah, your travels? Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we we um, it's a little less efficient than going to a gallery district and seeing a bunch of different things, but mm -hmm. we do see um, that. We do a lot of that in uh, Brooklyn and Williamsburg, and we do some of that in the Bethesda, sort of Washington D.C. area. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much on the West Coast. Most, you know, most of the artists on the West Coast, it's, you know, just the travel is ridiculous in terms mm -hmm. of that. So. Yeah. Okay. But well, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Do you sometimes I prefer? Say, to I, mean, I have to say the the most efficient thing. I mean, for better or for worse. I mean. For us, you know, the, the most efficient uh, assemblage of the opportunity to see a lot of art very efficiently has been the the fairs, and the fairs, you know, have been pretty terrific. I mean, it's not terrific that there's 14 fairs, you know, in Miami this year, but um, it is great that a lot of uh, a lot of art is being displayed and a lot of art is getting sold at these fairs. I mean, it's probably 40 or 45 percent of the revenue of you know, most of these galleries now is coming from the art fairs. Do you travel overseas for art fairs? Just for uh, Basel and maybe to London, but that's more going there anyway. Yeah, it's kind of nice. So what do you think the future of art fairs is? I mean, I keep hearing everybody, including me, thinking that they're it's overkill and they're going to implode, but I don't see it happening. I think that... Uh, 
they're a very efficient uh, way of letting uh, you know serious people see a lot of good art without the wear and tear, without all the issues you alluded to. I mean, look, I wouldn't. There's probably ten German artists that I would not have been exposed to, but for seeing them in Miami or even in New York, and having the work there and being able to buy the work there and not have to deal with all of the complications of international stuff. And also, we don't buy from slides. I mean, we see everything before we buy it. So, um, you know, it's just a very efficient system. Now, you know, does it work out great for the galleries? I don't know. You know, I don't know how many years Expo Chicago will last because I'm not sure that uh, a lot of these galleries um, made, you know, the kind of money that they need to make in order to come back. Maybe they'll come back for one more year. But, um, you know, the whole theory of Chris Kennedy was to try and have the, the cost and the prices of the art that was being exhibited match the audience that they expected to attend the regional art fair. And, you know, Tony's view was, oh, no, this is not a regional art fair. This is a very fancy international art fair. Uh, and we'll see. We'll see whether the buyers really showed up. My sense is the buyers didn't really show up. So That's my sense, too. But they seem to be, I mean, the, the word I hear is, is that, there were a sufficient number who were pleased that they can count on having a solid exhibit, you know, next September for a second year. Yeah, I think a, I think a second year will, I think that'll be fine. But, I mean, you know, you have to keep in mind that, you know, that's going to run out if the economics run out. I mean, these people are going to accommodate uh, the Guthmans and the Manilows and a few of these people to a certain extent. But... You know, I don't think any, I don't think there were people falling all over themselves that thought they, you know, sold some staggering amount of. Uh, of no, I totally agree. How do you, I mean, when you're buying, when you're doing all this research online, I, would, I was expecting that you were buying artwork from seeing it online, et cetera, and not that you saw everything in the flesh. No, we see everything in the flesh. So does that mean you try, I mean, let's say you're looking at, you're turned on to an artist in Mexico. And yeah. you like the image, and ultimately, before you commit to it, you'll go to Mexico and see the art. Yeah, but not for one piece. I mean, we'll we'll that's right. That, you, you, you so we'll, trip we'll build a trip. So we we'll build a trip to San Francisco. You know, a trip to New York, or several trips. You know, every uh, every couple of months to New York. Um, but you know, Germany, Italy, once a year at least we're there and they know we're coming and either we'll associate it with a fair or else if a bunch of these artists are coming to um, to Miami, then we'll see them there. I mean, I you know, there were some people that were at SOFA that were artists from Mexico who uh, sent me a note and said, you know, could you come by? I've got a couple of new pieces and, you know, that's perfect. It's very, you know, I mean, look, the, the web has, has been an unbelievably, you know, useful, uh, you know, tool for this kind of stuff, but, I, I really do think that it's, you know, if you if you are really buying art and you're really concerned about execution and all of this stuff, that um, there's no substitute for seeing it, you know, in person. I agree. But that, that's even true with people whose work you already own? I mean, you already know well, that the execution well, is going to be... Well, slightly, yeah, so slightly less so. So, for example, uh, you know, in the case of uh, uh, some of the people that we... When I, when I say if they're doing a new group of paintings and we already own a couple of their works, uh, then I think you're right. Then we would say, all right, uh, this particular image we like. We know that once the show opens, it's going to go pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, you know, we want to have that piece so that we would buy sight unseen. That cool. would be the exception, cool. yeah. Um, you collect other things besides art. Yeah, to a certain extent. So, banks has lunch boxes. Uh, that's about it. Cool, Dimitri. Oh, pop, pop, um, pop bottles. Okay, Dimitri, go ahead. Yes, Howard. Thank you very much. Um, I'm having almost <laughs> an emotional uh, reaction right now to see so much figurative art. For years, I've heard uh, from many people how it is impossible to sell anything representational. And for years I've been trying to repackage and camouflage my Russian Soviet traditional training into something <laughs> that would look more like something that fits 
into a gallery, and then all of a sudden I, I, I'm at this webinar, and <laughs> it makes me think, what's, what's your philosophy? Why uh, figurative art? Um, do, do you have a broader view at what you're doing right now as opposed to what's going on in the gallery world these days? Well, I think that, you know, again, I mean, my, my subsection of the gallery world are the galleries uh, that do and represent the kind of work that I'm interested in. And those galleries, very frankly, are thriving. I mean, John Pence in San Francisco, Forum Gallery in New York. Uh, there's probably five or six galleries in New York. Uh, you know, in Denver, the Plus Gallery uh, in Santa Fe, uh, you know, there's a couple of galleries. So I, I would say that there's probably 10 to 15, there's a couple in Miami, a couple in Atlanta, uh, galleries, all of whom are specializing in figurative art. I mean, I think there's a, a lot of figurative art. And I think part of the reason is that people can understand and appreciate if it's really well done. I mean, I think it's, it's really hard to say, oh, this abstract piece is really well done. But I think it's pretty easy to determine whether it's a really gorgeous painting of a figure or of a person or what have you. So that's, I mean, that's, you know, our tastes were were that simplistic in a sense. I mean, it's hard to appreciate abstract art. It was not hard to appreciate, you know, uh, beautiful drawings of the figure, whether they were drawings or paintings. Would you say you're less interested in artist statements and rhetoric and, you know, all kinds of discussions for you is just a love yeah. at first sight, basically, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think we've I think that we have, uh, of all the pieces that we have, of all the pieces, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces, I don't think there's any pieces that we wouldn't buy again tomorrow. The only exception I would say is that we have in the last five years, I'd say five to ten years, gone slightly away from hyper-mechanical photorealistic stuff to stuff that's a little looser and has more narrative. And that's just become more interesting than the stuff that you absolutely couldn't tell whether it was a photo or not, which of which we have plenty, but which is slightly cold and slightly less interesting to me than it might have used to be. How do you feel, Howard, about people in this course whose work they, they think you would respond to sending you images or writing you? Uh, that's fine. I, I tell everybody to feel free to send me whatever they'd like to send me. Okay. Um, I think we've got time for two more questions. Karen, go ahead, and then we'll end with Lynn. I was wondering if you, what advice you would give to artists as far as strategy or tactics to be successful. And I know some artists have PR agencies. What do you think as far as marketing or, or getting their work out there so that um, the public knows about it or the collectors know about it? And I was just curious what you thought. Well, I I don't know of any successful you know artist who's used a publicity you know agent, uh, so I I wouldn't know about that at all, and I certainly would think that would not be a, as good a use of your time as trying to be included in shows uh, that are shows organized around the kind of art that you do. I mean, I think that that's. Uh, that's the most uh, likely and powerful venue to be discovered uh, is to be in these exhibitions or shows or fairs or things like that. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, there is uh, there's a little something to be said for networking, but I think the networking has more to do with reinforcing your, you know, interest in being an artist and sort of you know, being surrounded by people who are equally passionate and excited about what they're doing um, and less about selling, you know, selling your art. I mean, I just think the truth is that, um, you know, I don't, I, I sort of fear, I mean, Paul was saying, you know, uh, what's the average age of my artists and of the artists in the collection? And I sort of fear for whether these young kids and the reason that we surrounded them at the school with all this art is I don't know if they're going to collect art. I just don't know if that's something that is even within their, I mean, first of all, I don't know if they're going to have homes, you know, I mean, there's, a, there's all kinds of different issues relating to, you know, whether, uh, you know, in a 
in the world we're entering into, uh, if you're living in your parents' basement or if you're living, you know, in an apartment with three other kids, art isn't the highest order of, you know, uh, of a purchase. And, and so, but more importantly, I just don't have any sense that kids in their 20s have any appreciation for buying art, sort of collecting art, and most importantly, for supporting artists. I just don't think they, you know, they get that. Now, maybe they would get that. It's funny because it's 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 not a, an issue of figurative art, but I would think they would get it entirely if it was their friends and they were trying to make a band successful. I think they would say, oh, yeah, shit, we have to go to this show. We have to support our friends because they're trying to make it as a band. Um, being an artist is a much more solitary and asocial thing, and it's much harder for that reason. And so um, I just think it's there isn't a similar kind of mechanism. It's not like you can invite 80 of your friends to show up at Metro and support your, uh, you know, you being the opening act of some performance. So to be in these shows, don't you have to be with a gallery? I mean, you... You know, I don't know. I don't, I think it depends on the shows. I mean, the Evanston Arts Center has shows. The, uh, you know, there used to be a thing called the Vicinity Show. There used to be a lot of different uh uh, places where people were picking and choosing and curating shows. Have you ever gone uh, out, Howard, as a result of seeing it at the uh, the artist at the Evanston Art Center, the Elmhurst Museum, the Hyde Park Art Center by gallery? You know, totally. Okay. All those places. The Cultural Center. I mean, I think, you know, I think that the Cultural Center mounts some pretty interesting shows. I mean, I think one of the things we're going to suggest to them is they do more. I mean, Look, the real disappointment has been that the Museum of Contemporary Art has done a relatively shitty job of promoting or supporting Chicago artists ever, you know, since its inception. And that's that's unfortunate, but it's also unfortunate that we don't have a vicinity show anymore. You know, we used to have, what, what Paul, every other year or so, right? Yes. You know, and that would be 50 or 100 or 150 different artists, and some would be gallery, but some would not be gallery. Now, keep in mind, I mean, I mentioned before publications. So New American Paintings and uh, some of these other publications, uh, you don't have to be in a gallery. I mean, they are completely open submission uh, selections, and they're curated by different art professionals. And you can get in one of those publications without ever having, you know, had a gallery or any kind of gallery representation. And that's a great way to get in front of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of artists or uh, collectors. Thanks. All right, last question is Lynn. Go ahead, Lynn. Hi again. Um, I was wondering, are there any trends among collectors that you're seeing that you either like or dislike? Um, for example, is there anything that you'd like to see differently um, in terms of how collectors as a whole go about collecting, influencing, and participating in the art world? Well, I think the... Um I think the problem that that it's sort of an interesting problem. I mean, I think that that we um, we err in favor, and it's much harder, by the way, to do a really big piece if you're a realist, you know, artist. Um, we err in favor of scale. So everything we have, I mean, because we have hundreds of thousands of square feet of display space and huge spaces at that. I like to buy the largest examples and the best examples of a different artist's work. I think, though, by and large, that the tendency is to of a lot of artists is to work very small, and of a lot of collectors to buy sort of smaller examples of, of works and things like that. Whether that's because they fit into different kinds of spaces, or they're just not as costly, or whatever it is. Uh, so I, you know, very often, I mean, we just we will say to an artist, um, we'd like to just see pieces that are, you know. Three, three by four or larger or something like that, because small pieces might work at home. I mean, you know, I have smaller examples of work and stuff, but for the purposes of sharing it and putting it in the spaces that we're dealing with, we like large scale stuff. Now, the large scale stuff is also harder to transport to these shows and it's more costly and everything else. So I'm, I'm starting to see a lot of instances where you'll go into a space at a show or in a gallery and everything will be you know, uh, nine inches square or something like that. And that's hard for me. It's just because that's not the kind of art that I'm interested in. I'm really interested in, in art that occupies a substantial space and really 
you know, you react to. It doesn't, you know, it's not possible to sort of walk by it and have it be part of the wallpaper. So, Don't you think that a lot of what has encouraged artists to work smaller is art fairs and art dealers who want to be able to exhibit multiple artists in a booth and not be able to show something 8 by 10 feet because it predominates? Well, I don't know because, you know, at least about a third of the art fairs have been very uh, aggressive in saying we, we're going to insist that you only bring one or two artists. You know, most of the, most of the fairs are about equally divided. Some can, you can bring your entire, you know, gallery's uh, representation. And some will say, I only want to see the work of one or two artists for exactly the reason that they don't want these booths to be so busy that they look like they're sort of, you know, uh, bargain basement, you know, uh, thrift shop sales of here's 40 different paintings. They really are looking for sort of the throwback to the old days when, you know, an art fair was sort of a seminal event and artists would accumulate really good examples of their work and only show it on the opening night of the gallery, show it at these various art fairs. Now, almost everybody sells out of their studio. Everybody sells all year round. Everybody has to try and figure out how do you create enough material for five and six major shows. I don't know how they do it. It's hard. hard. I think more than three is a lot. Yeah, just the art fairs alone is a lot. Now, you know, Lynn's question made me think, you know, in terms of the collectors in general, there was a survey I saw, saw coming out of Northern Europe less than a year ago that was in interviewing art consultants, mostly high-end art consultants, who said over 50% of their clients buy artwork with the investment potential in mind. Um, I don't get the feeling that's what motivates you. No, I don't know. We would never do that. I mean, I, I think we only buy art that we really love. And I don't think, you know, since we never sell anything, I don't think, you know, that that is would ever enter into it. I think a lot of, I think more and more, unfortunately, collectors are buying with their ears. And, you know, they don't even know necessarily the content of what they're looking at, don't comprehend necessarily what's going on, but they know that it's almost de rigueur to have to own, you know, thus and such because somebody else does. You know, look, that, that hasn't changed. I mean, when Phyllis Kine was, you know, presiding over the Chicago art scene, you couldn't go into a home in Glencoe or Highland Park of a certain size and not see a Roger Brown piece. And when Roger Brown tried to change his style, there was, you know, two whole revolts. One whole revolt was from Phyllis. They know, paint exactly what everybody expects you to paint so that everybody will know that it's a Roger Brown. And two, the collectors were also, you know, sort of up in arms that he would dare to change, you know, his paintings. I mean, when he left sort of the silhouette buildings, that were iconic and started painting mushroom clouds and things like that. I mean, a lot of people freaked out. I mean, and that was exactly to this issue of uh, buying what everybody else knew to be valuable, that was popular, that was, you know, what was sort of the hot setup. The good news today is I think there's so many artists that nobody knows, you know, and nobody can comfortably say, oh, these are exactly who you should own if you want to have a representative collection of whatever it is, you know. Let me close this up. I, this is, what do you think about Art Prize? About Art Prize? Yeah, you know, the show in Ann Arbor. No, um, Grand Rapids. Uh, you know, I th I'm going up there for Steelcase and for Amway. And, I, you know, we'll, I, I, ha I don't have a lot of, uh, I don't have a, a sense of that whole situation at the moment. So I, I, don't, I wouldn't say yay or nay. There's a lot of people who, I mean, it, it's funded by the son of a particularly far-right wing, anti-NEA, keep government out of the arts kind of entity. And to the yeah. extent that it pervades the show and what's going on there, you know, is really interesting. But mostly the things that do well there are really large, really figurative, and really patriotic and or religious. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, if you're talking about the, the Voss family from Amway, yeah. uh, I, I mean, I know them. They've been great. Honestly, they've been pretty great supporters of the arts in that whole part of the country. And really, I don't think they've uh, influenced it by their personal views because at each there's three generations now of the family. And right. the younger guys are a lot less, uh, you know, right wing crazy uh uh, they're not like the Koch family and stuff like that. But 
um, I, I am going up there to see them. I mean, uh, you know, they're, they're people that I know and deal with, uh, along with all the people that run Steelcase. And both of those organizations are, are very interesting. I mean, Steelcase is a manufacturing company that is only alive today because about 15 years ago they decided that they weren't in the manufacturing business. They were in the design business, which is like one of the great things for art uh, that you're ever going to find. And they're, if anybody changes sort of the traditional outline of how offices are and work areas are structured, it'll be people from Steelcase. You know, so. All right, listen, I want to say thank you to everybody for your time. Thank you, thank you too, Howard. It's been great. You've been really wonderful. Thank you very much. And let me unmute everybody so that they can literally echo my <laughs> opinion. Howard, thank you again. All right. Take care, Howard. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.